particularly thrilled at the group that we have here um, talking about <coughs> groundwater and groundwater drawdown. So there's this narrative about how we're destroying the environment by drawing down aquifers. It's red in California, and it's not just the US, it's in India, where the water tables are running dry. Um, there are some amazing pictures out there about how land subsidence has caused the ground. This is in the Central Valley, so this is where the land surface was in 1977. That's where it was in 1955, and that's where it was in 1925. So if we're taking water out of the ground, the ground is collapsing beneath our feet. And it's not just the amount of water that's in there, it's what's in the water. So there's actually a bunch of people here in Minnesota thinking about some of these issues about you know, how polluted is our groundwater, what's happening to it, we're destroying this resource. But of course, the reason that we're drawing down aquifers and indeed putting things in aquifers is because groundwater is really useful. So for example, there are lots of things that are credited um, to the Green Revolution, but one of the most important in India, for example, is the availability of groundwater for irrigation and actually being able to make use of that resource is really widely credited with being the reason that India actually produces enough food to feed itself now. And there are aquifers all around the world. And this is one of the reasons that groundwater is so important. It's a resource that is almost ubiquitous, and it's great because it's a storage resource. It's right here, it's something that we can use. But it comes in really different forms. So there's places where there's really large expanses of groundwater, there's places where there's less groundwater, and it doesn't all recharge at the same rate. So some places where um, water is moving really quickly into groundwater, other places where we're basically using fossil resources. And so all of this brings me to this question of, is drawing down aquifers really so bad? And as Todd mentioned, this is really, this is a pretty provocative way of putting it, um, but I like to be provocative because that's why you're all here, right? <laughs> we could put this a little more gently and ask a question of, you know, when does it make sense to use groundwater? And how do we make decisions about when it makes sense to use groundwater? And so that's why we're here today and there is a fantastic panel um, and so really what today is about is your guys' questions and asking them. So we're going to get three different perspectives on ways to think about groundwater and groundwater management. And then really the floor is open to you and your questions. So first we've got Perry Jones. He's from the USGS Minnesota Water Center. Um, then we're going to hear from Steve Pulaski, who's in the part here at the University of Minnesota in Applied Economics and Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior. And then Sherry Ensler, who's the general counsel at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And I'm really excited to hear from all of them to get a little perspective for you guys. But you know, keep your pencils out. Think about questions that come up as all of them are talking. They're going to give really short presentations. And then it's on to you. So thanks very, very much for coming. And we will start with Perry. Well, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate everyone coming. You need to get your microphone. Oh. That also helps. How's that? There we go. Okay. Okay. One thing I want to clarify is um, is what is groundwater? And a lot of people have a general idea what groundwater is, and a lot of people, and I think they know what it is, but they often don't know. And really what it is, it's water that is below the land surface that fills in a lot of voids, or it could be fractures or anything, and it's filling underground rocks and sediments. And so what we see often terms that are include, um, Kate used the term recharge. What, what is recharge? Well, recharge is the water that seeps from the land. We have a rainstorm. You get it. You get water that then recharges from the land surface, goes down, and then recharges into this environment called the groundwater system. And the groundwater is basically where all the voids and the fractures are filled up with water. And so, and often we use the term aquifer, and we the term aquifer used. That's the underground rocks and sediments containing groundwater. And that's where a lot of people get their water supplies. They put wells down and they get water supplies, often they, they, the, the water interacts and 
comes to land surfaces, springs, or interacts with lakes and streams. And so a lot of my work has been focused on groundwater and surface water interactions. And it, basically it's the exchange of water and its components between aquifers and other groundwater systems and surface water, surface water bodies. And this is just shows an example of, of a case. This is on White Bear Lake where you can see seeps that form out. And this is where groundwater is actually discharging from the land surface. And we can actually see this from an air, air photo. You can actually see the, the iron staining. And this is a process where groundwater is coming out and oxygen uh, iron is precipitating out. So it creates these iron stains. And why this is important is, is that often when we talk about groundwater resources and sustainability, often it's very hard for people to visualize how how much groundwater we actually have in the system and, and how it's how it's changing. And but they can see lakes and wetlands and they can see how the levels change on those. And some of those factors are caused by changes in groundwater. But it's not only groundwater, with lakes you also get exchange of various processes. You have precipitation, you can have droughts that would cause lake level lowering, you have evaporation that takes water off the surface. And you also get um, groundwater that comes in in some lakes and then it may go out be in other parts of the lake system. And so what we do in the environment, such as taking water out of the aquifer system, can affect lakes and it can affect wetlands, but it also can affect our groundwater system and how much water is, av is available. And for example, this is an example that shows White Bear Lake and the water levels have decreased since 2004 on the lake. And some of this could be due to precipitation and some of it could be due to well, pumping that's nearby and other factors. And it actually reached a historic low back in um, January of 2013. And so what we often do to figure out what's going on with groundwater and, and how susceptible it is, we look at um, water level data in wells. And we can see this is a trend we're seeing in White Bear Lake with some of the wells that Minnesota Department of Natural Resources on it, uh, monitors. And what we're seeing since 2003 is more fluctuations uh, in the water levels in the groundwater system. Now, is this cause to be of concern? It may be. And, but I think it's something important. And right now, the Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources is working on a developing a groundwater management area for the system. And they're doing more intense monitoring in the area to figure out, are we having problems with lower groundwater levels in the area? And is, will this impact some of our water use in the future? And so I'll leave it with that. Good. Well, thanks. I'm glad uh, you started with like real facts. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a groundwater expert. Uh, I think you invited me here to talk about um, translating this into um, value for people. How do we use the water and how, and actually Kate, you, you kind of said two interesting things. Like I, I interpreted your question, how, you know, how should we be using groundwater? And then there's the question of how do we use groundwater, which of course may be very different. Um, so I'm gonna have a, I'd like to keep in the back of your mind and in my mind a very simple type of model. It's called the bathtub model of groundwater. So, so, so we, 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 have a, we have an aquifer down there, and the aquifer is refilling due to recharge. We may be uncertain as to how fast it's re recharging, but we also have a, a drain on, in many of these systems, which is, I mean, some of it's, it's leaking out naturally, but, but we have increased the drain, right? So we, we're pumping out groundwater in many parts of the country at, at large rates. Now, why are we doing this? As Kate said, we, we're, we're doing this for, uh, for a reason. I mean, this is maybe supplying uh, for domestic <coughs> use, but uh, large parts of it, especially out in the Central Valley, is, is due to agriculture. So we're getting value out of pumping out groundwater. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's good. Um, the concern is, are we pumping this out at a rate which is faster than it's recharging? In which case, we're mining the groundwater, and so now we're going to have a trade-off between present use or increasing <coughs> present use and future potential uses of the groundwater. So in the how should we be using groundwater, one would want to think about kind of the value of using it at present 
versus the value of keeping that groundwater in place so that we could be using it potentially in the future. And, and by use here, I actually do mean a, a fair, I mean, th there's lots of impacts from that groundwater, as Perry was, was talking about. You know, if we start to draw down the groundwater, maybe that's affecting springs and things at the surface as, as well. So there's, there's a wide set of consequences that one should think about in terms of how uh, we use it. Now, coming back to the how do we use it, I mean, to me, oftentimes I, I look at how we do use resources, and it's almost as if there is no forward-looking um, view on this. It's like, well, the resource is here now, let's, let's use it. Um, but, but really, there is this trade-off, and, and we should be thinking about present values versus having things off into the future. And one more point um, on that before I turn it over to, to Sherry is, you know, you, you almost could think about groundwater as an insurance policy. I mean, it's there. It's, there's a stock that's there. Surface water could, could be used instead, but surface water is highly variable in many parts of, of, of the world. So you could imagine a case where you're thinking about using groundwater, the ability to have pumping groundwater in times of drought on the surface and allowing the groundwater to recharge and, and um, uh, restore the aquifer in times of, of plenty of surface water. But if you use up that aquifer, then, then you've used up your insurance policy. So with that, I'll stop and turn over to Sherry. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the Department of Natural Resources is thinking about some of these issues. And um, some of the struggles. And the struggle we have is relating to science, and in some respects, I think about groundwater as a black box, because we don't know as much about what's going on in the groundwater aquifer as we know about what's going on about in the surface water, and we certainly don't know as much about how they interact as we would like to make sound public policy. The other thing we struggle with in Minnesota is we have historically operated from a paradigm of abundance. And we are starting to think about the fact that we can no longer operate from that paradigm. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about what DNR is thinking, how we're moving forward, and some of the challenges we're facing as we try to integrate this science with policy and then throw it open to some questions. So I want to start with this concept that in Minnesota and in the United States generally, and this isn't true internationally, in some, some countries this is very different, but in the United States water is a public resource incapable of private ownership. So in the United States people only have a use right to water to the extent that they have access to water. And water law in the United States is fragmented, but for the most part, who gets to use water is governed by state law, not federal law. And the only role that the federal government plays, I shouldn't say the, the only role, but the role of the federal government is limited to, number one, navigability, that you can't take so much out of a surface water body that the water body becomes unnavigable, or two in the cases out west where there are extensive water projects, where there are extensive public investments, there are federal water pro um, compacts that go to the allocation of water to various states, but once the water gets to the state, the water is divided according to the compact. In terms of groundwater, the federal government role is very, very, very limited. And we are seeing this play out more and more when we get into some of the contamination issues. So water law is fragmented. Generally, the law governing um, groundwater is not as developed as the law governing um, surface water. It's a modified, what we call a modified riparian system. So at common law, if you owned land over a groundwater aquifer, you have the right to sink a well to extract water for use 
on your property. You didn't have the right to extract water, to sell that water, to use it off your property. But you had the right to use the water on the property. And the rest of the water belonged to the people or the public in common, and the state then could permit the use of that water. Your use of that water was subject to limitations. That is, your use could not interfere with your neighbor's use of that water, or the water in the groundwater aquifer. Your use could not interfere with the broader public's right to the aquifer. And the federal government had no greater right than any other party. So in order for the federal government to have a right to groundwater, they had to have property over the aquifer. That system in most states have, has been codified, and that's the case in Minnesota, um, where groundwater is now regulated by state law. That's found in Minnesota Statute 103G. And Minnesota has a complex groundwater appropriation system where if you are going to extract or you want to use groundwater, in most cases, you have to get a groundwater permit unless you're going to extract water for personal use on your property for 25 people or less for domestic use. That means for bathing showers in your little garden out in your backyard. Otherwise, you have to come to the Department of Natural Resources and you have to get an appropriation permit from the state. This is very common across the United States. Most states, including Minnesota, have a hierarchy of uses so that if there's not enough water, we prioritize the uses. The first, of course, use is domestic use, followed by agriculture, power production, and then other industrial and non-essential uses. We use this same water allocation structure for both surface and groundwater. Any appropriation over two million gallons per day requires approval by the legislature. So historically in Minnesota, um, most of our water has been, or most of our appropriations have been surface water, but we have been moving more towards groundwater appropriations. Um, before you can appropriate groundwater, as I mentioned, you have to get a groundwater appropriation permit. The commissioner is required to monitor the impact of those permits, and if a community requests a permit, the community has to develop a water supply plan. If you have either a surface or groundwater permit, you also have to have or encourage to have conservation plans. And the commissioner does have the authority to limit groundwater appropriations. So let's talk about this in a little greater detail. This is um, the trend in surface and groundwater appropriations from 1990 to present. And what you will see is, historically, we have relied on surface water. We are, as I said, seeing a growing trend and a move towards groundwater appropriations. And we are also seeing a growing trend towards irrigation. Minnesota, historically, did not have a lot of irrigation or a lot of irrigation um, groundwater appropriations. We're seeing significant increases in groundwater appropriations for irrigation in parts of the state um, beyond what we've seen historically. Minnesota has adopted a um, water sustainability um, goal or a parameter. I've listed several different definitions of water sustainability, but here um, is Minnesota's um, water sustainability, and it means water that does not, water use that does not harm ecosystems, degrade water quality, or, <clears throat> or compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this meeting and addressing this idea of water sustainability is challenging 
particularly when we're trying to figure out how to appropriate water. And we're trying to figure out kind of this mix of how do you maintain the flow necessary to maintain rivers, lakes, and streams and leave sufficient water in the system to maintain ecosystems and for future generations. Um, I borrowed this from Perry's boss, Jim Stark. Hypothetically, if you're looking at sustainability from a policy perspective, you would like to think this is what we would look at. The bottom line indicates the water needs of the ecosystem. The top line equals the water available in the system, both groundwater and surface water. It's that wedge in between that you could hypothetically appropriate. Determining what that wedge is and then dividing that wedge is easier said than done. So how do we do this? Minnesota law has historically, or requires that we look at cumulative impacts. Historically, Minnesota has approached water appropriation, both surface and groundwater. Basically, if you come in the door, you ask for an appropriation permit, we take a look at it, we see, are there any neighbors that have groundwater wells? Are you gonna interfere with them? No, okay, you get a permit. We're now starting to look at this and starting to say, hey, what are the cumulative impacts of this groundwater withdrawal and what are the impacts how is this going to affect long-term sustainability we're starting to identify areas in the in the state where we think that there are going to be longer term sustainability issues such as the north and east metro the straight um, river the bonanza river valley so um several years ago minnesota <coughs> because the Minnesota legislature adopted Minnesota Statute 103-G-285. What the legislature did is said, DNR, when you appropriate from a surface water body, you have to look at the collective appropriations. And there is a threshold below which you have to you cannot allow that water level or that water body to drop. And I won't get into the technical calculations. But it requires the DNR to look at the impact of appropriations on surface water bodies when we do surface water appropriations. And then it also says that if we think that an appropriation is going to limit, impact a trout stream, we have to give that even greater protection, and we can only issue a two-year permit to an appropriation that is going to affect the level of a trout stream. Shortly thereafter, the legislature adopted 103G-287, which had the effect of saying, DNR, when you give issue a groundwater appropriation, you have to also think about what is the impact on the surface water. Now, we have to be able to demonstrate, in that case, a causal relationship. Right? And we have to we have to look at 285. So 285 says, listen, if there is an impact on the surface water body, and we think it's going to be significant, the commissioner can set, number one, a protective elevation below which the lake should not drop. So if we think there's going to be damage to a lake that we're taking too much water and the lake starts to drop, the commissioner can set a protective elevation. We then have to start limiting surface water appropriations. 
And then if we can show that there's some kind of causal relationship between a groundwater appropriation and the surface water, we have to also start limiting groundwater appropriations. Keep this in the back of your mind because this is what's playing out right now in White Bear Lake and the White Bear Lake settlement. This is what we're going to be doing in the next two years. Um, the statute also says, 287 also says, in DNR, Commissioner, in those areas of the state where you think that there is going to be groundwater shortages in the long term, we are going to encourage you to establish groundwater management areas. And Paul Putzier Air, who is here today, heads up our north and east groundwater management area. The goal of that is to work, that statute is to establish areas where we think there are going to be challenges and to work with the communities to develop a groundwater management area plan where we really look long term at what we should do to start conserving and changing how we deal with groundwater in that area. So for example, the draft groundwater management plan in the North and East Metro talks about do we need to move from surface water, from groundwater to surface water. It talks about working with communities to develop some robust, more robust conservation measures. This plan will be adopted and it will then be implemented over five years. We're also working in two other areas of the state on groundwater management plans. Those areas of the state are areas where we're seeing a significant increase in irrigation. Another area where you're seeing a lot of, um, where the legislature has focused a lot of attention is calcareous fens. Calcareous fen is a particular type of wetland, very rare. Minnesota statute says that a calcareous fen cannot be drained, filled, or adversely impacted. And the DNR has interpreted this to me that we cannot issue an appropriation permit that will result in a groundwater appropriation permit that will result in depriving a calcareous bin of part of water in whole or in part unless we de de determine it to be necessary. And the commissioner has determined that simply increasing row crop production is not a necessity. We're involved in now three contested case hearings because we've denied three irrigation permits um, because the permits, if we grant them, will cause adverse impacts to calcareous beds. Again, groundwater appropriations. So I want to talk about a couple examples. First is the White Bear Lake litigation. I brought the settlement agreement. How many of you are familiar with White Bear Lake? Okay. So USGS prepared a study. They said that there was a correlation. Is that you didn't find causation? In the no, study. it was a correlation. Correlation between certain appropriations from groundwater appropriations from certain communities and the decline in White Bear Lake. There's also a correlation between rainfall. So you could see this and, and so a group of homeowners around the lake sued the DNR and their allegation was that the DNR's water appropriations was causing the lake to decline. Um, we, were, we were getting ready to go to trial this month. 
Um, the communities wanted, uh, or the, the folks around the lake wanted augmentation. The DNR thought that was a really dumb idea. Um, and they thought it was a really, wasn't a bright idea because healthy lakes, as most scientists know, need to go up and down. And the augmentation goal was to have a stagnant lake level. The DNR also recognized that there were long-term sustainability issues in the north and east metro. So we agreed to settle the case and the proposed, the settlement proposal, and I have a copy of the settlement here, um, in that proposal were really, is really designed to implement or try to implement some of these long-term sustainability questions in the face of scientific uncertainty. So what we have agreed to do is to move initially six communities and eventually 13 communities off of groundwater onto surface water. Huge pushback from these communities. And the pushback is you cannot tell us for certain, number one, that our drawdown is causing lake decline. And you cannot tell us for certain or that this decline or this the issues you see in sustainability are going to be here for the next 50 years. Why should we do something now? So huge community pushback. And why should we bear this financial burden? Second thing we agreed to do is set a protective lake elevation. We'll be using scientific expertise to do that. We'll, um, both within DNR, we'll be calling upon the USGS to do that. The third thing we've agreed to do is work with the communities to establish very robust conservation programs to try to reduce water use. The goal is to get the communities in the North and East Metro to reduce water use by 17% within a 10 year period based on an eight year past average. And then we'll be requiring the plaintiffs to work with private well owners to do the same type of reduction. But uh, as I mentioned, we're receiving significant pushback from private, from the com other communities in the North and the East Metro. So we'll see where that goes. Stay tuned, watch the legislature. We'll also be, as part of that, implementing the North and East Groundwater Management Area Plan. Another area you'll see in the news, Pineland Sands. How many of you have seen anything about this in the news? It's a proposal in northern Minnesota to convert thousands of acres of pine forest in sands to um, potato farms. RDO Offit, who has proposed this, came to DNR and has asked for 80 wells to appropriate water in the straight river valley, an area that we anticipate or have identified as an area that has, um, is challenged as a challenged aquifer. We said time out stop. We want to do an environmental assessment worksheet to determine whether this project poses a significant adverse environmental impact such that we should prepare an environmental impact statement, an EIS. Again, receiving some significant pushback from legislators, a lot of local support. But again, pushback because we're saying we're not doing business as usual. We're saying we're going to think about the impact of these decisions, in this case, not only on the, the impact of the number of appropriations on the aquifer, but also about the use of nitrogen and irrigation on sands over an aquifer 
that provides a significant amount of water to local communities up there and also is a source of water to the Mississippi and the, other, and the Strait River, so it could increase nitrogen contamination in those water bodies. Um, the other one I just want to mention is we have a number of trout stream permits where we are, are de going to be denying um, water appropriation permits because they're going to impact trout streams. We anticipate that each of those will be contested. We have two, the Larson's Farm is the most recent that we have denied a permit for irrigation um, that in the farm presently grows row crops. The purpose of the permit would be to increase the production level of the row crops We've determined that it will adversely impact the fen. We have taken a precautionary principle towards the fen and are now being challenged in court on that determination. So that's how we're thinking about how to address these long-term sustainability issues in the face of scientific uncertainty and uh, in, in the context of a public that is used to getting water when they ask for it. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you guys all have lots of questions because I have lots of questions. <laughs> um, but since I have the mic on me, I'm going to take the, the privilege of getting to ask the first question, <laughs> which is, so do you guys think we're having a water crisis? I think there's areas which um, we have limited groundwater resources because either they're in where the groundwater is located in isolated fractures or sand bodies that are isolated, which makes it very challenging, or the water quality is, is not as good, and so people will have to deal with that. Also, it, I think, so there's areas, pockets within the state, and I think it's uh, across the nation, across the world, where we have water quality, uh, water quality as well as water quality issues to deal with. What do you think, Sherry? Um, I would agree with Perry. I do think that the crisis isn't uniform. And I do think that in some places it's water quality, in some places it's def definitely water quantity. I think our biggest water quality crisis in Minnesota is agriculturally related. But I do think, too, that we have so, we have, have so long presumed this, or operated from a paradigm of abundance that in many cases where we are poised to avoid a crisis, and we are reluctant to move forward because we don't want to admit there is a problem because we're so used to thinking we have so much water. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to pick up on that. I mean, there's lots of places where we act as if there is no conflict, there's no trade-off. We can just have as much water as we want for as many uses as we want, and that's just not true. So, you know, there's the physical reality of what water there is and what rate aquifers get recharged, and there's the rate at which we use it, which is oftentimes exceeds that, so we're not being sustainable in that sense. So then there's the societal question of how do you sort this out, which is, you know, your, your cases at DNR here. I mean, this is more serious than other places. You know, think about Old Gowala, uh Reservoir in the Plains. Um, some places you wouldn't think about as having water problems feedback problems. <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there's a Supreme Court case in, um, in the southeast between, this is surface water, but um, the, the rivers that flow out of Georgia and into the Florida panhandle. You know, it's like, I think of that as a fairly wet part of the world, mm -hmm. that they're having um, over overuse um, of, of those water, uh, of that water body there. So, you know, how do we as a society actually come up with the rules for how you divide something which is in fact a scarce resource. 
I think to add to that, the other issue is we have this kind of love-hate relationship with water. So we we want to we want it and then we want to get it off the land as quickly as possible. So I think about this in Florida where, you know, they have this water crisis and yet they want to drain it all out of the Everglades. So they're dumping thousands of gallons into the, into the ocean. In Minnesota, we look at our farming communities where they want to start pumping our groundwater aquifers to irrigate, and yet when you drive through southern Minnesota and you look at the thousands of miles of tile that they're putting in to drain that farmland because they want to get the water off the land earlier in the spring to, um, to get their crops in earlier, we kind of have this love-hate relationship that causes us not to use the water wisely or think about, you know, wiser ways of kind of keeping the water where it is so that we can be smarter about it and allow for recharge. I know right now, if you look at southwestern Minnesota, they're piping water, getting water from the Missouri River, bringing it into southwestern Minnesota. And that's partly because there's the, the lack of water down there uh, as far as groundwater, and also the, um, the water quality issues. They have high sulfate. And so I think that's, that is happening in, in some areas. Right? I'll jump in on that one as well, though. Steve may want to correct me. Um, you know, one of the things about water that's really hard is that when there's not very much of it, it's really valuable. You'd be willing to pay quite a lot of water if you were thirsty, but it's not very valuable when there's a lot of it. And when you think about agriculture and what, what the ability to pay is for the kind of volume of water that you need for agriculture, it's low. And that's where moving around large amounts of water stops making sense. Water is, your bottle of water might sort of begin to look like a reasonable um, equivalent to the same amount of oil, but the amount of water that you need to irrigate a farm is worth almost, the monetary value of it is so low. You'd be willing to pay quite a lot of water if you were thirsty, but it's not very valuable when there's a lot of it. And when you think about agriculture and what, what the ability to pay is for the kind of volume of water that you need for agriculture, it's low. And that's where moving around large amounts of water stops making sense. Water is, your bottle of water might sort of begin to look like a reasonable um, equivalent to the same amount of oil, but the amount of water that you need to irrigate a farm is worth almost the monetary value of it is so low that you could never pay to move that kind of water around. And the thing about water is that it's heavy. It's really energy intensive to move water around. That stuff is heavy. I'll just build off of that. You know, it's like, where, where is this valuable? So think about where we move lots of water. Well, the Central Arizona Project is where we move lots of water a long way uphill from the Colorado River up into, into Arizona. Why? Well, you know, actually there it's, it's an interesting thing. So some of it is, is for domestic use, and you think, well, yeah, it's pretty valuable to have water in Phoenix and Tucson and so forth. But, you know, some of it was just to grow cotton in the desert. Probably not a really wise use. Well, and, and a lot of that was heavily federally subsidized on pennies on the dollar. The other thing is, at least in the, in the Midwest, in the West, that was possible because there were federal compacts created by dam projects that kind of overrode the state primary jurisdiction over water. I think moving water, especially in the, from the eastern United States where it's more abundant west, is going to be more difficult because of the law surrounding water. There is no federal jurisdiction that would allow you to move water from the east to the west.
Um, probably Perry's better at answering this than I am, but I, I think what our folks do, and Paul probably can answer this better too, is when we think about this in terms of head in the aquifer, so we're looking at the aquifer head as opposed to you know what we would look at on the surface. But Perry probably, and Paul, who is behind you, can probably give more insight because I've had a couple of hydrology classes, but you did great, uh, <laughs> That's good. Well, I, I there's it's particularly in some areas like where we have karstic bedrock, uh, where we've got limestone caves and, and quick groundwater flow. Um, that they can be quite different, the surface and the groundwater, and those boundaries, the watershed will change uh, seasonally as well. And uh, Jeff Green from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has done a lot of spring shed mapping and using tracers to figure out how those uh, groundwater divides change in the surface water. And as far as management goes, it's, it comes back to how much data and how good quality of data do you have that you can actually do appropriate management of the resource. And so I think it always falls back to that. Um, there's also areas where you have fractured bedrock, and that's also difficult to figure out what's the groundwater shed for that versus the surface water. Sometimes it's fairly easy to determine, other times it's not. I think it goes back to how much monitoring information do we have? How much data do we have that we can look at? And typically you want to look obviously at, at what is the groundwater levels? Are they changing and how do they change relative to rainfall and other events and, and other things? And you have to look at not only knowing the, the, what your aquifer is doing, but also looking at what are we doing as far as withdrawals from that aquifer? And so you have to look at pumping rates and monitoring that information. And Minnesota Department of Natural Resources does a lot of good work monitoring those systems. And then you also have to look at how that relates back to surface waters and how that may then, do they reflect the same changes? Now, again, Groundwater pumping and withdrawals is one factor to look at. If you're looking at lakes and other issues, you have to look at also the other factors that can cause changes in lake levels. Just like groundwater systems, you have to look at all the variables that may be causing it. If you get a drought, you're, you're probably going to have lake levels that go down. But in the more recent decline, we were seeing that the annual precip wasn't changing very much yet, the water levels are going down. And it's similar to values that the kind of decline we're seeing during the 88 drought. I'd also like to add that there are newer technologies that are coming online to monitor changes in groundwater. So historically, we've always done this by looking at wells. You know, put in a well, and then you see what happens to the water level. There are starting to be some really interesting satellite technologies where we can look from space and see a very large and heavily estimated scale how our water levels changing. And you know, that seems to be the thing we really count on. But I would like to note here that one of the things that we're really, really bad at understanding is how big the actual groundwater resource is. And so it's really hard to know if a change in groundwater is a big change unless you actually know how much you have. And it turns out it's really hard to figure that out. Um, so I will also throw that little tidbit out there for you guys to mull on. Being the classic two-handed economist, I'm going to say it's both. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's demand always relative to supply, right? I mean, you could you could have a place that doesn't have much supply, but if, if there's no demand for it, I wouldn't say you have a crisis or over demand. You know, it, again, it's it's like how much are you demanding relative to the resource base? So, you know, if you're in a dry place and you've got lots of people demanding it, that's where you're going to have a have a severe problem. One other question that just came online that's pretty interesting too is, what if there was a market for water, for water tradability? How would that impact this discussion? Okay, so I guess that's directed to the economists as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there actually are water markets in various places. I mean, California has uh, water markets. Um, Australia has uh, interesting water markets. 
Um, there's always a tension in these water rights. So the classic economic argument about it is, you know, it's got multiple uses. We've got a limited supply. Let's put the water to where the highest and best use is, and those are the people who are going to bid the most for the water. Um, politically, this, these water markets tend to be really charged because, um, you know, you're maybe taking it out of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a right. It's not a, something that's a commodity that, that should be traded. So um, there's, some, there's some issues. And then in practical terms, not, not sort of philosophical terms, but in practical terms, there's difficulties in thinking about, you know, if, if I'm trading with you, Todd, are we actually affecting uh, somebody else, a third party here? Um, and can we guarantee there aren't those third party effects? So. And there are, there are, I think you, you noted this with the, not to is water right. There's there's interesting human rights implications to thinking about water markets. Right. So what if I'm really poor? <clears throat> Does that mean that I don't get water if I have to buy it on an open market? And even if we put in a, a control for that so that there was some allocation of water and then beyond that, water was a market. This comes back again to this question about the, the monetary value of water as a factor of production in agriculture. Well, how much are we willing to pay for food? Part of the reason that food is as inexpensive as it is is because the inputs to food are mostly not that expensive. Well, if I am an industrialist, maybe I can pay a lot more for water than a farmer can because people pay a lot more for my widget than my ear of corn. But at the end of the day, is that actually what we want to see happening? Oh, and I think, and I, this may not, I mean, the law around groundwater is a little uncertain, but certainly as it relates to surface water, which is where much of the United States gets its water, <clears throat> the public trust do doctrine would seem to prohibit the sale of water for profit because the public trust doctrine requires the, that government manage the trust op asset, which is what water is for the benefit of the people, not for private gain, which would be what would happen if we commodified water. And so there's the, not only the human rights aspect, but the obligation of government in the management of water for the benefit of the people. So you brought up actually the two really important issues, which is you know who's using this water. Fracking is a new use, so it's often a new pressure. And in some places, like in North Dakota, there's not that much water available at times of year when they're trying to use it. So there's sometimes a pressure that's just a supply-demand question. <coughs> the reality is that fracking doesn't actually use that much water. Um, it's just that it's 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 often an additional um, pressure on a system that may or may not. Be, have the, uh, the flex in it to provide that. I think more. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, part of the fracking problem, and I'll, I'll defer to others on this, but, but uh, you, you know, when, when, you, when you produce, and actually even conventional oil and gas too, you, you actually bring up a lot of water, which is very contaminated. So, and the question is, what are you going to do with that? And, you know, typically they inject it back in, but yeah. So the contamination issue is then the other really important issue. And it's not totally clear that this water isn't cleanable. It's just that cleaning it is expensive. And the people who are extracting it aren't particularly interested in spending money to clean it if they don't have to, um, which makes complete sense from a business perspective, but it makes me a little uncomfortable as a you know, human on Earth. Uh, <laughs> But it's, in, in many cases, it's not that this water couldn't be cleaned. And in fact, I mean, one of the great things about evaporation is that it's quite effective in purifying water. So if you were to let the water evaporate, you could theoretically clean up all the, met the metals and stuff that were in it. Um, it's when it escapes that it's more of a problem. So you see a lot of concern about the water quality um, for in the Marcellus Shale, for example, in Pennsylvania, because this could be in your side yard. Um, and so people are much more concerned about that. Well, I think just one quick note. It's not only just a water quality issue. It's, a, it's the fact that when you're fracking, when you introduce these fractures, you're often connecting aquifers that are not connected previously. So what's happening is, is often 
is that you'll see someone's water level in their well ultimately go down because the refracting is now connecting aquifers which were either uh, not connected before or were perched and now were, were connected. Yeah, I guess I would say too, you know, I, I would agree with what Perry said, but I would also say that you know, we should not limit our concerns to fracking. There are a number of industries in this country that we let get away with murder vis-a-vis -vis our water, most notably um, the, the agricultural industry. And I think really what we need to think about as a, as a nation and as a world is that water is essential to human life. And we have to think about using it wisely and sustainably because we know that the amount of water we have on Earth is finite and as our population grows, the amount of water per person we have in the world is going to diminish and so the wise use of that, of that water is going to become more and more important as our population increases. So we have to think more wisely, whether it's fracking, whether it's agriculture, we have to start saying to all of our industries, we have to use this water wisely.